The earth speaks in many languages, but only in one voice. These are Enrique Salmon's words. Salmon is of the Raramuri peoples who live in the Sierra Madres of Chihuahua, Mexico, and he's a beautiful writer. And he goes on to say, this one voice is a voice that emanates in unison from every living thing on earth. It binds our breaths and nourishes our integration. The loss of only the tiniest member of the union weakens the voice, which may soon become a whisper unless we begin to speak for those whose languages are not heard. The unheard, he says, includes not only plants and animals, place or open spaces, stream sides or oceanscapes, they include people. They include people. Not unlike our opening hymn, lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Enrique Salmon wrote these words in an essay called Sharing Breath, which is a part of a wonderful collection of diverse voices in a book called Colors of Nature. And I read this book as a part of an immersive study back in 2019 that looked to communing with nature as both an act of personal spiritual healing and opening a way to get closer to God as well as one of collective liberation, a place to practice justice, both, both. And Salmon's words, like so many others that we studied back in 2019, taught us of the great and swelling call, call rising up right now that is asking for our ears and begging for our attention it's a call emanating from the too long unheard voices of marginalized peoples from the earth and all her living things and a call rising up from within our own bodies, right? You know this, right? We can feel it. And my sense is that these voices are all saying we are out of balance. The great web of interdependence with which we are all a part is in need of repair. It cannot hold like this. We cannot hold like this. We closed our many months study back in 2019 with a pilgrimage that took us to Mount Desert Island in Maine to many this land is known well as Acadia National Park. And the purpose of this pilgrimage was to, as Salmon writes, bind our breath to the breath of that land. Don't just read about it, feel it. Seriously, we were there to integrate and to do so with reverence and humility. And we were taught to walk and move gently, to listen to the whispering voices. That is what we were taught. And I had never hiked like that. I mean, not many of us move like this ever, really, right? On one particular climb, we were taught about lichen. So we gathered at the trailhead and learned about this part fungus, part algae for nearly an hour. And listen, there are like 3,600 species of lichen out there. You've seen it climbing up trees attached to other plant life. It's everywhere. And it's a super complex life form that we move past all the time, no matter where we are, giving very little to no notice of its existence. But we can't live without it. We can't live without lichen. Lichen protects trees 
and plants from harsh environments. They absorb pollutants. They convert carbon dioxide to oxygen and so much more. And the lichen we learned about up in Maine was the kind which makes a home on these massive boulders and rocks that make up so much of Mount Desert Island, rocks we were about to traverse that day. So lichen, the lichen that grows on these glacier rocks create ecosystems that sustain the soil between the boulders, which are then connected to the nearby trees and their root systems and ultimately the far reaching forests. The complex system of interdependence and mutuality existing so far beyond our human senses. But on Mount Desert Island, the balance of this system is being compromised. Because well-intentioned hikers, like myself, continue to step on the lichen as they scramble up the boulders on the way to the summit to take in the beautiful view and enjoy themselves, and it's killing the lichen killing the lichen. We looked at thriving lichen and lichen on the trails, and the difference is stark. So on this trek, on that day, we climbed with this unheard species in mind, the tiniest member of the union, as Salmon writes. That is what we were called to do that day. And let me tell you, trying to climb a mountain and not step on the lichen is a challenge. It completely changes how you move. It slows you down tremendously. It alters your relationship to the environment. So often we humans are mainly tending to ourselves on hikes like this. Our experience, our breath, our picture, our chosen footing, our awe at the view, our comfortable pace. And it's not easy to give some of this up, which is what you have to do if you're not going to step on the lichen. So not stepping on it means that your head is down pretty much for the whole of the hike. It's not all about you. And suddenly you find that this small, seemingly inconsequential utterly trampable life is so much bigger than you. And there you are together trying to work things out. That's how it felt for me anyway. Ninth century Celtic philosopher John Scotus Urgina regarded the whole world, all of creation, as what he called a thin place where divinity illuminates and enlightens ordinary matter, a thin place. And the thin place on this particular trek for me revealed itself in that ordinary lichen. Am I trying to work with it and see it, feel it? And this might sound strange to you, but it felt like after a few hours we were conversing with each other, the lichen and I. And this might sound really strange to you, but I began to feel bound to that lichen. Like the lichen was both a part of my thriving and that my treading carefully was a part of its thriving and that I was the lichen, and the lichen was me too. I don't know if any of you have ever had that experience in nature. Yeah. So last Sunday's service, where we looked more closely at the eighth principle and its bold call to action in our faith, I know that much of it can leave many really confused. I'm confused too. Right? How can we simultaneously look within, cultivate spiritual wholeness for ourselves, for that is what this principle is calling of us, calling us towards. No one self to be loved and enough, blow kisses to ourselves in the mirror, right? As Beth, Beth's words offered us. 
while also waking up to the immense amount of work we need to do in the world. And for some of you, this might feel really contradictory. And many of you might be asking, well, which one is it? All is well and I am enough or get to work and get changing. Which is it? And my answer to you is this. Just like the simplicity that is the lichen needing to be cared for on those rocks so that the massive sprawling forest ecosystem and beyond can thrive, so it is with us. Needing to be cared for so that we can thrive so that in turn we can help others thrive. So it is with us. Lauren today offered us deeper insight into our seventh principle. I love that arc. I wish, you know, the kids learn this stuff in a way that some, we grown ups need these images too, right? And so often this glorious statement of the seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part, so often we make a profound mistake when we limit it to merely an environmental idea or charge out there because it is so much more as lauren said it is the balancing place between the individual i need care i am enough and the wider world's needs the collective needing care and we are bound up in each other's care and thriving when we know ourselves to be a part of the interdependent web of all existence, then we are no longer merely consumers or takers or even saviors or protectors or die-hard givers, but are rather balanced in voice and in need. And when any one living being in the web is out of balance, we are all out of balance. So you believing yourself to not be enough or unlovable means something, touches the souls of all living things. Your suffering is our suffering. I'm returning to my lichen, now our lichen. The mindless trampling and decimation of the lichen decimates a part of us. And while our thriving depends on thriving forests, yes, and in turn depends on thriving lichen, those careful communing steps I had to take up the mountain were also, and this is really important and was really important to me that day, an opportunity to know the lichen as myself, as I said earlier, precious and vulnerable and worthy of care and love for isn't the human spirit mighty and wondrous and also very so very precious and vulnerable aren't we the same nature offers us these mirrors most everywhere and we need only trace our fingers over nature's cycles and systems to know ourselves a bit better my friends and to humbly know our place in the order of things. And this is how I am coming to understand interdependence. And it's a really helpful way to find our way towards the we-ness and away from just the I-ness or the you-ness, the we, it binds you and I like those threads, right? In Lauren's story, it's binding. But here's the thing, there is no we when one is only outward focused, outward focused and leaves oneself out in the rain. And there is no we when we only consider ourselves and leaves our, leave our fellows out in the rain. And I'm not just talking about human relationships, but our relationships with all living 
things. A good question to ask and one that I ask myself all the time is whether your life, your relationships, the way you move through your environment, what you consume, what you buy, what you notice, is it with the we in mind? The depths of one's own soul and the souls of all that live and breathe about us? Is it with the we in mind? I promise you don't have to choose between the two, the you and the I. Honestly, the spiritual wholeness that the eighth principle is calling us towards is just that. It's wholeness, integration, one voiceness. Nothing and no one is left out. I was taught on Mount Desert Island about this kind of balance. I caught this blessed little glimpse of it. And I think this lesson is everywhere, not just on the majestic peaks of that blessed place. It's in our interactions with one another and how we talk to one another, the words we use, how we listen, how we share of ourselves, how we receive others, how we receive care, how we are made uncomfortable, how we hurt, how we hurt one another, how we say sorry. And I don't know about you, but I want to be someone who embodies good balance and presence and intention. Don't you? I want to be someone who moves gently over this earth and with my fellows and with myself. And I know that I'm striving for this and I know that I fail at this. And I know that I keep trying at this. And I do know I'm not alone in this and neither are you. Blessed be the we, right? Blessed be. So here's what I ask, is to keep at it, keep at this. Write down the seventh principle and put it up somewhere in your house or in your car. I did this earlier this week just to get it in my bones. I can't tell you how helpful it was to wake up every morning and read that principle. And consider this we-ness and this precious web with which we are all a part. And let it remind you to look for the lichen and to slow down and move gently and know it as yourself. I know that sounds so strange, but it's a wonderful practice. And know it as me and know it as we. And if ever you would like to take a walk with me like that, I would love it. Name the day and the place I will be there. And so I close by saying, blessed be the we. Blessed be the we. May that be so for you as well. And amen.